everybody online. And yes, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so the timeline for the event is going to be simple. I'm going to do introductions real quick right now. And then Matt's going to walk us through the, uh, the real meat and potatoes of the presentation. He's going to be explaining how to read uh, electric gas bill. And he will be answering questions, but I think we want to hold them off to the end, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. so anybody who has questions, you can throw them into the chat, but we will be answering all those at the end. So just know about that. And then, yeah, Matt's going to walk us right through the end through the next step through a petition that uh, we want you all to sign. So anyway, introduce myself. My name is Emilio Rodriguez. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I am one of the industri- I mean, I am one of the environmental justice organizers for the People's Army. I've grown up on, and I still live in the South Side of Chicago. It's the East Side. Now, growing up on the South Side, uh, pretty terrible environmental quality, pretty bad air. Uh, we're home to a lot of manufacturing and a lot of pollution, both in the past and present. Um, growing up, or I mean, in the 60s and 70s, the South Side and the East Side were home to uh, steel mills. And for a long time, that really polluted the ground, so most of the ground in the area that was toxic. Afterwards, uh, it's still the east side is connected to the Calumet River. So it's kind of like a port, and uh, boats would come in and drop off industrial waste. One of the things they drop off is petroleum coke, also known as pet coke, which is a major air polluter. Being by the water, I mean, just anything picked up by the breeze, pet coke is uh, picked up by the air, blown anywhere. I mean, parks, homes, uh, you name it, if you're around it, it got on you. And it wasn't healthy to breathe. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a major polluter for a long time, and we lived with it for a long time until people actually got together, and started to organize. Uh, they started to gather together, started to uh, sign petitions, and they started to form their own organization, such as the Southside Environmental Task Force, and eventually went for protection. And eventually, Troll and Coke was actually removed from our neighborhood. It's not stored there anymore. So we actually did get a major victory. But like I said, past and present. The east side is one of the farthest southeast communities you can be. It is also home to predominantly minority folks. I think about 92% of the population are uh, Mexican. And you can only imagine the difference in uh, social quality that it comes from instead of being in an affluent neighborhood. Everybody is predominantly blue collar. Okay. So yeah, our fight is definitely not over. Just a couple of years ago, they tried to introduce uh, a shredding company into our into our neighborhood. That shredding company had several EPA complaints prior to moving, and naturally, folks on the east side didn't think anything was going to get better moving into our neighborhood, which already has very poor air quality. Um, it's because of pre-existing coalition. It's because of the noise that folks made. It's because that people came together that we were able to fight off uh, General Iron, which is a shredding company, and they're not here today. So yeah, the point I'm trying to drive home is that people always try to trample on other communities. It is a matter of coming together and making voices heard and organizing that you can actually experience some victories and win some back to have a, a livable home. So I also, let me tie it all up, um, I'm an environmental justice organizer for the People's Lobby. We're a grassroots organization that operates in and around the Chicagoland area uh, to ensure the common good. We, uh, fought for the, we fight for the working class and we often collaborate with fellow organizations and throw down for whatever we think is going to help the most folks at that point in time. Um, we uh, collaborate, we, uh, we're a part of the Fight for 15. Uh, we helped and at, we were one of the organizations that supported ending catch bail. And right now, I know some of us are working on the gig workers ordinance was trying to uh, secure a livable wage for folks who need Uber and Lyft and our drivers like that. So we also um, build base in the community. We, or, uh, we organize support for progressive uh, legislation, and we try to put uh, pressure on elected officials and other powerful people to put the interests of people and plants first. So now at this point, I'm going to open up the floor for anybody to share um, why they're here, uh, what they do, and what they hope to get out of this uh, event. You like Sarah? Sarah, why am I here? Sure. What's your name? Oh, my name is Tim. I live in Aurora for previous years. Um, we, we have a house like uh, my young and my house. Um, 
Uh, I saw the lately I'm I'm kind of retired and I see the library has an interest program. So I said I'll come to see so I registered I don't mind. I'm to check it out. So you said you're retired, what did you do for work? Oh I actually I was still working part-time. Oh, I'm a, at the early retirement mm -hmm. and I'm working part-time. Um I'm doing the senior care, senior service. Uh, senior care a coordinator uh, with mm -hmm. the related with uh, senior benefit program. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. Also, folks in the chat can type in and say where they're from, what they're up to, and uh, how they heard about the event. Thank you. The chat is definitely going to come back again. So just have to smile. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it'll come up. It'll come up, but I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, so we'll give folks a couple minutes. Can I ask you a question? What, what area is the site of the movement? So Chicago is the mess. It's the part of the southeast. You could be so the east. Yeah, nearby the Chicago, nearby IIT, or? A little bit south of that. Uh, by Chicago University? It's a little bit south of Chicago University. But I live on 109th. IIT is like 33rd, and like Chicago State's like 95th, 97th, yeah. something like I that. I was leaving, you know, the Blue Island mm -hmm. and the uh, 57th Street, uh, you know, more south side, mm -hmm. when I went to college. Oh, okay. And I spent uh, about 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I went to college in uh, downtown Chicago, so and we, we, we have a friend uh, right now, Carmen. Nice. Okay, I, I can know what it was. Oh yeah, and then we're also so the east side is here, like ten minutes away to the west. That's White, Indiana. Do you know the Horseshoe you can see over there? Yeah, so like right over there, right by the BP oil refiner, which is another polluter of air quality within the south side. Right, right. So it's all all come together like that. We, we, we did not go that far. So mm -hmm. Okay, any questions in the chat? Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, I made a I made a small change to our audio settings because someone said they were having a little trouble hearing. Okay. So keep talking and we'll see if, if they get back to me and say that's better. So okay. So for right now, we're gonna give folks a a uh, couple more minutes to still throw stuff into the chat, but now we're going to transition to the informational portion of our segment where Matt's going to show us exactly how to read gas and electricity bills and then offer us uh, some opportunities for weatherization tips to help save some folks some money. So now I'm going to hand it off to Matt. Well, cool. thanks, Amelia. All right. Can folks hear me from over here? <laughs> I'll just keep talking and if folks need me to, to speak up. Yeah, so. hopefully. Yeah, if you if you need us to make any changes to the audio, please just let us know. Cool. Well, <laughs> thanks to everybody who's coming, both in person and virtually. Um, and especially a big shout out to Emilio and the People's Lobby. Um, they do a lot of important work around organizing, uh, like he said, many different issues. Um, and I know they're doing some work around some of the rate hikes that we're experiencing, which I'll talk a little bit about those rate hikes during my presentation. But to his point, I think it's really important that folks get engaged with this stuff because some of these decisions are being made without public input. So, you know, working with organizations like the People's Lobby can help you kind of get plugged into that fight to reduce the pieces on your bill that you really can't do without supporting organizations like People's Lobby or CUB. So CUB or the Citizens Utility Board is a nonprofit organization that fights the utility companies on y'all's behalf as ratepayers. So I'm a program coordinator there. I work in the outreach department been there for about eight years, eight and a half years, start to lose count after seven, I find. So um, it's been a while though, um, doing a lot of presentations like this one, but CUB is a nonprofit again that fights for rate payers. So for example, whenever the utility companies attempt to raise their rates or pass some legislation that isn't very consumer friendly, we're the organization who goes after them. So we're in your corner, making sure that the utility companies are playing by the rules for the most part. An uphill battle most days, but we try to do our best. We do have a 1-800 number here. It's that 1-800-669-5556. 
number right there. It's open Monday through Friday. That is our consumer hotline. If there's one thing you remember from my particular spiel, let it be that you can call this hotline again anytime Monday through Friday, nine to four. We have some really awesome dedicated staff that works that hotline that can answer any questions you might have that are related to your utility bill. Stuff like I'm thinking about streaming and I don't know what to do. How can I go about like switching to something like Netflix to how do I get solar panels on my roof? We cover a lot of ground and we're always happy to chat. So give us a ring if you have any questions and all the resources that we have today here in person have our telephone number on them. And I know folks are in the chat. We can figure out a way to maybe send some folks stuff digitally. I can maybe send you, you some resources and folks are registered. We can. Yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, um, I'm happy when people register for the program. It gives me their contact information, Sweet. so I'm happy to send out um, anything that people are interested in. Awesome, thank you so much. So we'll do that. I'll put together a little package and I can send it to you, so folks can get it at virtually. Um, we also have a really good website, citizensutilityboard.org. All of the resources that I'm going to discuss today are directly housed on that website. So it's another good thing to bookmark. So if you ever have any questions in the future. Um, you could always call us or you could thumb around on our website. Chances are under our resources tab, there's going to be a fact sheet for the particular question you have. So definitely check that out. And like I mentioned, I'm part of the outreach team at Cub. Spend a lot of time out in the field in rooms like this one, both in person and virtually. Our outreach team does about 500 events a year all across the state. And there's like four of us We're running around all the time. It's what we do. It takes up most of our time. Um, and we also have a, a, an event calendar on our website. So if you're curious about checking out some of our other events, um, we have a lot of good stuff about solar. We have new stuff about geothermal coming up. Again, stuff about like cutting the cables, switching over to streaming, ton of content on there. You can check out our event calendar and see what's going on. It might be in person, could be a hybrid event like this one, or just virtual. So something to check out. And a lot of the, again, resources I'll talk about today are directly housed on that website, created by our communications team. They're super great. They do a really good job of boiling down some really complicated issues. Things like solar policy or um, group buys and you name it, EVs, all of those kinds of things. They put together these guides to try to break it down in a way that we can all understand it. So with that being said, I'm going to jump in unless folks have any questions about CUB. I'll give folks a second here. I don't know if folks do, but if um, for the remaining piece of the presentation, if you do have some questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Well, and then we can ask them in person as well. We'll save like, I don't know, 15 minutes at the end to go over some questions. So I'm going to start with the electricity bill, then we'll go to the gas bill, and then we'll talk about some programs. But my goal here is to try to get folks to understand exactly what's happening on your electricity bill. Because I think a lot of times when I look at my electricity bill before I worked for Cub, I was like, what is this? What do all these line items mean? In some ways, it was, it was incomprehensible. There's a lot of random stuff there. But I think a lot of it is a bit more simple than we would think. So I'm going to go through some of the things that I look for. When I'm at an event like this one, we have these events called utility bill clinics where we sit down with folks one on one. We look at their utility bills um, and I'm going to kind of go through what I talk about or, you know, focus on at those events. Some of the main things that I look at. So I don't know if folks on Zoom can see my pointer here. So I'm going to try to articulate as best I can to the folks on Zoom what I'm looking at, what I'm talking about. But for folks in the room here in person, we have this little laser pointer. So let me know if you're having trouble seeing this. But the first thing that I look at when I'm looking at a utility bill, gas or electric, is the energy usage, which is this part here. It's this bar graph here. This is really important because this shows us what we're using month to month. It's a really good way to see what our general benchmark is for our usage. You can also determine if there's any inconsistency that's happening on your bill. I think that's one of the most important things to look for is inconsistency. Specifically, we're looking at this bill. It's a little bit older. It's from 2020. But this consumer's usage cycle was in October. So this October, this teal bar here under total usage was 201 kWh or kilowatt hours, which is the measurement of electricity. And we can compare that to the previous October, so October of 2019 for this particular consumer. Um, and you can see there was actually a pretty big difference. This consumer used 52 kWh or kilowatt hours in October of 2019. And then this October, they use 201 kilowatt hours. So if this was your own bill at home and you saw some kind of difference like this, that would be a red flag. This particular consumer moved in uh, October and November. So that's why their usage is so off. However, if you do go home and you look at your utility bills or you're online, and you're looking at them right now, that's something to try to identify is if you're seeing those inconsistencies. You can further hone in, whoops, to the right here, where it says average daily use. These rectangles here break down 
that information even further. So this teal rectangle here is the current month's usage. So I'll show you what you're using daily. So this consumer is using 6.7 kWh daily. And then it'll show you if your usage is up or down from last year. So that's important. This particular consumer is up 272%. If you see a number like that, that is again, a very big red flag with this consumer we were talking out in the field, which that's how we got this bill. One of my colleagues was speaking with somebody about it. They would say, well, I moved then. Could that be the reason why that happened? And our answer would be yes. Other things could be weird month, right? So for example, we're in a weird month right now as far as weather goes, April. We've seen 85. We've seen 25. Our usage is going to vary quite a bit here in April. And it's probably going to be a bit different from last April. It's just one of those months. We have these weird transition months in the Midwest. So that could be a reason you could have had folks staying with you, perhaps using more energy. However, if you're kind of like going through the list of things that could be driving this change in your energy usage, and you can't really come up with a solution. Again, that might require some more detective work. It's a red flag and you might need to kind of hone in even further on that. Um, it also shows, I should mention the average temperature. So that is, if it is a weird month like April, you can see, well, you know, it was 75 degrees on average this April, but then the last one was 50 degrees. So perhaps I was running my air a little more. Um, so it's a nice little tool you can use to kind of do that detective work. And maybe you can just suss it out right away and see if there's some kind of difference there. The next piece of the bill is the current charges summary. This is just a general breakdown of where our money is going on our bill. So these are three different components on this particular piece. There's the supply, the delivery, and the taxes and fees. And we're going to come back to this because if you were to flip over, if we had our physical bill here and you flipped it over, you would see the back of the bill that's a variety of different components. It's the breakdown of the supply, delivery, and taxes and fees, which you can see right here. So the taxes and fees, such as life, right? <laughs> All things that we purchase, we have to pay a little bit extra to it. A lot of the programs that we'll discuss today um, are funded in some part here on taxes and fees. Not much you can do on this particular piece as a consumer. The same is also true for the delivery. Delivery is a bit different. Delivery is why you receive a comment bill in Northern Illinois. There are a few municipalities in Northern Illinois that might be with a public utility, but it's only a handful. So I would say about 95% of Northern Illinoisans are with a investor-owned utility, which would be comment for electricity. Um, so ComEd's job as the utility is to get the energy from point A to point B, point A being the generation, point B being your home. And we're paying for that process, right? That's why we pay an electricity bill is to use the energy, of course, but also to receive it. Unfortunately, again, on the delivery and taxes and fees, there's not a ton you can do, but I will say there is two things that you can do, two things that come to mind. The first one is that a lot of these line items here are broken down by how much we use. So it's a little, uh, you know, for example, here it's 201 kilowatt hours multiplied by a fixed kind of nominal fee here. If you were to use less on that particular, on this bill, you would then see your charges go down slightly, which is easier said than done, right? Sometimes you might already be very low end user and you might not be able to make much change in that particular area. Uh, but to be more energy efficient reduces cost on your bill in a variety of ways. So that is a good way to do it. The second one is staying in contact with organizations like the People's Lobby and CUP, because we are going to Springfield, the various courts across the state, like I mentioned before, fighting rate hikes, fighting things where the utilities are attempting to raise their money. So if you want to try to affect change on those particular pieces of your bill, stay in contact with us, because as Emilio mentioned in his intro, people power grassroots organizing is really important when it comes to trying to fight off some of these bigger investor-owned utility companies when they're asking for more money. And right now, the utility companies are asking for over $2 billion worth of rate hikes, not just ComEd. This is all of the utility companies in Illinois. Totals $2.8 billion is what they're requesting. So every person in Illinois is going to experience some rate hike potentially unless it's fought off. So again, stay in contact with us. I'll talk a little bit about it at the end here in ways people can get plugged in, try to help us out there. But those are the two ways you could reduce delivery or taxes and fees. The last piece of this bill is supply. This is the fun one. This is where we pay for what we're actually using, right? So this is where you're paying for the electricity. Um, and in some cases, you can have a different company on supply. So ComEd is the default supplier for your electricity bill. But in some situations, you can sign up for an alternative supplier. We call them alternative retail electric. 
and gas suppliers. They exist in the gas side, but we'll call them suppliers for short. So it could either be ComEd or it could be one of these other suppliers. Generally speaking, we do not recommend folks go with alternative suppliers. We find from our experience out in the field, talking to folks, seeing bills that when you do sign up with the supplier, you oftentimes end up losing money over the length of their contract. And I have an example of it here on this bill. So, um, and if folks online, if I'm not doing a good job of articulating what piece I'm talking about, let me know so I can better point to where I'm at on the bill. I'm using a lot of this, uh, this whoops, this laser pointer here. Um, so just let me know if I'm, I'm not articulating this well. Um, however, on the supply portion of your bill, in this particular consumer's bill, they were with the supplier. So it says supply, there's a hyphen, and they were with a company called Energy Plus Holdings. And they have this commodity charge, 201 kWh, how much they're using at or multiplied by 15.9 cents. Right now, that number probably seems arbitrary, right? What does 15.9 cents mean? What does that look like compared to what comments default rate is? The way you can tell what comments default rate is, is if you go to the right side of the bill under updates, there's this line item that says price to compare. This is a really important piece of the bill because this shows us exactly what comments rate is at that point in time, the price to compare, the default rate to compare, the supplier's rate against. So again, this is an older bill, so this isn't reflective of what the rate is now. But at the time, this um, the, the, the comment rate was 7.067 cents. And they were being charged 15.9 cents. So they were being overcharged by more than double. So if this consumer was just with comment as the default supplier, they would be paying around, my back of the napkin math is pretty terrible, but I think it's around $14 or $15, right? Whereas right now at this supplier, they're paying $32. So it's really important when you go home and or you, you get offline here, you get off Zoom and you pull up your utility bills and you're looking through it and you're like, what did Matt say? Do I have a supplier? To identify if you do have a supplier and if you see that you do have one, to look at what they're charging you and compare it to this price to compare. Very important because if you're losing money with that supplier, there's no value to staying with them. You're just losing money, right? The only value to being with an alternative supplier is to save money. So if you find you're spending more, you would need to cancel that contract. Um, the rate for electricity right now in ComEd territory is 9.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Aurora used to be with a um, alternative supplier for a municipal aggregation program. I, are you in Aurora, ma'am, right now? You're in Aurora. So you all used to be with a municipal aggregation contract, which is a little bit different than these alternative supplier, like door-to-door -door solicitations or seeing them at the movie theater at like a, a you know, a resource fair, whatever it might be. I kind of see them as two different contracts. You have the door-to-door -door ones where we see a lot of folks lose money, where you, again, you're contacted over the phone or they might come door, they might, you know, send you something over email, but then you can have this alternative, which is a municipal aggregation. And this is where the city or your municipality contracts with one of these companies in order to seek a discount. We find that municipal aggregations tend to be pretty good. It's because they're getting these really, really big contracts. Like how many folks live in Aurora? Like 80,000, 50,000? And more than that at this point. More than that, like 100,000. Yeah. So it's a lot of people to say the least, right? So these kind of, these companies are incentivized to offer some kind of discount because they're getting these sweeping contracts. The municipalities have some oversight built into the contract. So these can be pretty good. Um, the contract that Aurora had expired at the beginning of this year and y'all don't have another contract. So you're just back with either default ComEd or I couldn't figure out what company it was. But a lot of times when those municipal aggregation contracts end, those municipal aggregations or the, the companies that are running it will recontact you to try to set up another individual solicitation with them. So if you re-sign back up with the municipal aggregation, it's really important. Um, excuse me, I'm probably making this more complicated than it should be. Um, if you signed up with the company that was running the municipal aggregation after it ended, you could potentially be in a higher rate. So all this to say, if you do see you have an alternative supplier on your bill, Again, it's important just to check how much they're charging and look at the price to compare and do the math to see if you're saving money. Um, keep an eye on it. Make sure that continues month to month. If you're losing money, you're going to want to exit that contract. The way you can exit the contract, if you do find you have an alternative supplier on your bill um, and they are overcharging you, is to flip back to the front part. So this is where the blue box comes in. And then you can look who your supplier is. You can also see it here. This is another easy way to identify it. And it also will have their website sometimes, but it'll always have their telephone number. 
So if you do find you are losing money to one of these alternative suppliers, you can call that number that's listed there and you would need to request to cancel with that particular contract. Um, it takes a billing cycle or two. So if you call, depending on where you're at in your billing cycle, it takes some time for it to switch over. So you potentially could be on another billing cycle with this company and then the next one it'll end. Um, so it could take some time. You don't need to contact the utilities. So you just need to contact these companies. Oftentimes they'll give you some kind of like confirmation number and then ComEd will send you a note in the mail uh, a couple of days after notifying you of a change. Something to think about. Um, so with that being said, I'm gonna move over to NICOR here. Um, and then again, folks, if you have questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. We'll be, we can always go back to slides when we're doing the Q&A portion and address any questions you might have. So this is the NICOR bill. Um, a lot of the concepts, almost all of them that I described for the electricity bill for ComEd carry over to the gas bill. So the structure is very, very similar. It just looks a little bit different. There are a few key differences, but the, the general breakdown of the bill is very similar. So on the gas bill, you have the delivery charges, you have natural gas costs, which is synonymous with supply, and then you have taxes and fees. The taxes and fees and delivery, again, what are you gonna do? Except for be a little more energy efficient or stay in contact with organizations like Cover or the People's Lobby. Um, that is one way you can reduce those charges. A lot of these um, fees and, and taxes and line items are broken down by how much you're using. So again, energy efficiency is really important. Supply is in the same boat as ComEd in the sense that you can have an alternative supplier. There are different companies in the gas market. However, with the default rate for gas, um, it changes month to month with NICOR. So with electricity, the rate for electricity changes two times a year. It changes once in the summer, once in the fall. So it's a fixed rate for about six months, changes every six months. However, with gas, the big difference is that it changes month to month. It's because gas is a bit more of a volatile entity. As folks probably experienced here in Aurora and around the suburbs in NICOR territory, um, the rate got exceedingly high this winter and the fall, for this, this previous winter and the fall. It got as high as $1.24 per therm, which is the highest we've seen it in several years. Um, so I know a lot of folks are probably still reeling and kind of recuperating from this winter. Fortunately, the price of gas has gone down in NICOR territory. It's now 45 cents per therm, which is a lot better than $1.24. But this just recently happened over the last, like I'd say two to three months, it's gone down, but it's been really high for about six months prior to the price dropping down. So the gas bill does have a price to compare. It's still a little bit harder to see compared to the electricity. Um, so if you look at your monthly energy profile, which is circled here, this yellow oval, um, again, looking at your monthly usage is super important, identifying any of those um, inconsistencies that you might see there and doing some detective work if you do see them. Um, but if you go under that, you can see that there are numbers here, and that's how much the average cost per therm was with the default utility NICOR at that time. So that's the way you could identify how if you're overpaying with an alternative gas supplier. You could identify if you have an alternative gas supplier here on the right. So under a message for you and above monthly energy profile, these two boxes where these two yellow arrows are, line items could fill out there. So if you lost this natural gas cost section and it disappeared from here, and then you saw some line items on the right side of the bill, that is a red flag. That means you have something that they title additional products and services, which in short is alternative supplier. There are also some maintenance plans you can sign up for, which Cup does not recommend. Um, NICOR Home Solutions used to be the company that offered it, which isn't NICOR. It's like a sister company of NICOR, and they, by law, were required to change their name to Pivotal Solutions. So if you see anything from Pivotal Solutions on your bill, um, that's also a red flag, and you might want to look into what you're paying for and if it makes sense for you to leave that. Um, but if you do see an alternative supplier, very similarly to the electricity bill, you want to identify how much um, you're being charged, which for the life of me, I can't find a NICOR bill with a supplier on it. So I apologize. I wish I had a more concrete example. So we're going <laughs> to, these uh, two arrows are going to have spice. But you would see line items that would have how much you're being charged and then what particular company it is and their telephone number. So again, what you would need to do is you'd look how much they're charging you compared to the price to compare down here. Um, and then you could determine whether or not you're losing money or saving money and if it makes sense for you to leave that contract. That's gas in a nutshell. Now we're gonna get into some programs. For the, the remaining 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk about financial assistance. 
some programs that are available for folks who are income qualified or might be income qualified for these programs. And then I'll talk about energy efficiency, which is something that everybody can get plugged into regardless of your income. So there are a couple key programs here. The first one is LIHEAP. LIHEAP is about to expire this month. And if you think you might qualify for LIHEAP, it's very important that you call as soon as you can um, to get plugged in. I have the Chicago information here. I just realized that I forgot to change it from last time I was doing something. So I will get folks who are on online here, I'll get them the right number to contact. But every county has a different administration agency. Um, this is Cook County's. Um, are we in Will County here? DuPage. DuPage. I'm very off. We're not in Will. So yeah. DuPage County has community action agencies here that administer things like LIHEAP or food stamps or SNAP. That would be the organization that you would need to contact to see where their satellite agency is, who can then work with you to see if there are still funds available. But if you think you might qualify and you feel that you need assistance, LIHEAP is very important. It's a financial grant on both your electricity bill and your gas bill. Not only does it give you um, this financial assistance or this grant, it also gives you some additional protections. You're classified as LIHEAP consumer and things like the utility's ability to disconnect your particular account for non-payment um, is preserved. So they can't necessarily do that as your LIHEAP recipient. So there's some really important financial protections that happen if you're a LIHEAP recipient as well. Uh, but again, the funds were set to expire this month. They think they're gonna run out and they don't think they're gonna have summer funding. Um, sometimes these things change, so it's important to get in contact with your local community action agency, which if folks think they might qualify, again, I'll, I'll send a list that's uh, an up-to-date number, not the Cook County number here. And then for folks who are in the room, if you're interested, we can talk afterwards and I can get you the right info. The next program I wanna mention is the gas sharing program through NICOR. This is a $500 grant that you can receive on your gas bill if you do qualify. Um, so in order to apply for the NICOR program, um, it, you need to visit your local Salvation Army in person, which I do. I was looking up before I came here. There is a community center here, the Salvation Army somewhere in Aurora. So you just need to physically visit that in person to see if they have funds available for you. And for I should mention, too, for LIHEAP and NICOR, it's 200 percent federal poverty level is the, the income qualifications that you would need to meet. And I can send out these exact numbers. Uh, to folks who are interested as well. The next program is the Illinois Home Weatherization Assistance Program, or IWAP for short. This is a really cool program um, where folks who are eligible can receive free weatherization services and energy efficiency um, work done on their home. Up to $16,000 worth of the work can be done if you are income qualified. Um, it does stuff like air sealing, attic and wall insulation, HVAC repair or replacement, water heater repair or replacement, lighting and refrigerator replacement. And then lastly, if the contractors who are doing this work find that there's like asbestos or some kind of mold, there's three and a half thousand dollars that is allocated for cleaning that up as well, which is really important. Because a lot of times we're not doing this work very often. So there might be some mold that has gotten into these areas and they might discover that and they can clean that up for you. It's a really cool program. This is also 200% federal poverty level. Um, and again, I'll, I'll send all this info out. You would contact the same group for um, IWAP that you would for LIHEAP. So oftentimes it's done in one kind of like fell swoop through these agencies. All right, so the last piece of this, we're gonna talk about energy efficiency, which energy efficiency, I think, is kind of the unsung hero when it comes to either fighting climate change or just saving some money on your utility bill. It's like kind of this perfect combination of affordability and sustainability. It's a really nice intersection. Cub is a very big fan of energy efficiency. So one of the first things we tell folks who are sitting down at those utility bill clinics that I mentioned earlier is lighting is super important. So if you're somebody who still has those old incandescent light bulbs, you're missing out on a lot of savings opportunities. So about 15% of our overall electricity bill comes from lighting. Um, and if you're still using those incandescents, um, you're missing out because LEDs or CFL light bulbs, the more efficient ones, LEDs are more common nowadays, use 80% less energy than an incandescent. So theoretically, if your home is outfitted still with a bunch of incandescents, you could take that 15% and reduce it by about 80% just by getting those light bulbs. And there's a program that I'll talk about in a few minutes here where you can get these light bulbs for free. The next thing is called vampire power. A vampire power is the concept of appliances drawing energy even when they're not being used. 
Not every appliance does this, but we find that a lot of the newer appliances that we're bringing into our home, like the speakers you can like yell at and like play me whatever music you want to hear, tell me what the weather is that yells it back at you. It's cool stuff, but it's constantly running, it's constantly processing data. So we're seeing our vampire power figure raise quite a bit. So think um, smart appliances, I'm trying to think of my own home here to give some like concrete examples. I have a den in my apartment where I have like my computer and a TV and that TV always has a little red dot even when it's turned off, it's like an orangish red dot. I think a lot of like flat screen TVs have them now. The energy has got to come from somewhere, right? It's not drawing the same amount of energy it would be as if it were being used in real time, but it's drawing a small amount. Even things as like innocuous as like a clock on a microwave or a coffee pot, those kinds of things are constantly drawing energy. Again, not as much as they were if they were turned on, but they're still drawing energy. And if you could think conceptually of a home or even this room here, we could probably point out 10 or 15 different things in this room that are combining to, you know, put energy onto the, the energy bill um, here at the library. And the same goes for your house. There are several appliances that are plugged in that are most likely drawing that energy. So Natural Resources Defense Council did a study several years ago, and they looked at Northern California, and they looked at a, a pretty big sample size of homes, and they were trying to figure out where their energy usage was coming from. And surprisingly, they found that 23% of their overall bills came from vampire power which is much more than was previously estimated. So the Department of Energy has a figure that's around 10%, whereas NRDC from their findings is arguing it's actually more than double. And again, they attributed it to these newer appliances that we're bringing into our home. So these new like smart appliances are constantly running. They're doing some cool stuff for us, but they're using a lot of energy. You'll never get that 23% to zero. Very hard to do that. Um, Cause like a refrigerator is technically a vampire power. You don't want to unplug your fridge, right? Or maybe you've got a DVR player and you've got like American Idol set up every week and you, you got to watch it like totally fine. The general idea with vampire power is just unplugging these appliances that you're not necessarily using to try to limit that and kind of whittle that number down as much as you can and utilize things like surge protectors or um, they even have like smart surge protectors now where they're a little bit more sophisticated. You can plug in a bunch of stuff you can plug in the main appliance and it controls all the other outlets. And when you turn it off, it like basically unplugs the other um, appliances. It's pretty cool stuff. So there are some good ways to limit this and, and reduce what you're doing here. The next one is programmable thermostats. Very important to take advantage of those if you do have one in your home. Um, I know a lot of folks are just kind of like a set it and forget it kind of situation. I know a lot of times the programmable thermostats that are in our homes already are very hard to use, like mine in my particular apartment. I have to like basically have a magnifying glass to like try to figure out how to set it because it like barely works. It could be a little complicated, right? Um, but if you can figure out how to use that programmable thermostat, you could really benefit. You could reduce your bill um, by a pretty decent chunk by setting it to maybe go down or up depending on the season when you're away. So if you go to work every single day or you have some kind of appointment during the day, you can program your thermostat to turn up or down, again, de depending on the season. And then maybe an hour or two before you get home, you can have it step back to the temperature that you would prefer. So that way you're not heating or cooling your home for nobody, right? But you're lowering it, you're saving money on your energy bills and you're, you're more effectively using that energy. The numbers to aim for on your thermostats are 68 for the winter and 78 during the summer. They're kind of like the benchmarks where you wanna to get to. I know it depends on your home. Sometimes 78 might be too warm for folks. If you can get close to that, that's important. It's like they find the best, uh, kind of marriage of comfort and efficiency is those numbers. And there's also smart thermostats, which are really good options right now. And they're oftentimes heavily discounted online on ComEd's marketplace. And there is a way you can get some free ones if you are income qualified through an energy efficiency program. Ceiling fans are another good way to be a little more efficient. I should say with ceiling fans though, um, fans cool people, not rooms. So a lot of times folks think that you just keep the fan going in the room, it's gonna cool the room down. It's not necessarily true. It's just that you feel the air being moved down so you feel cooler because of that, but it's not necessarily cooling down the room. Another thing is that you can change, depends on your fan, but most of them have a switch that you can change the rotation in which it spins. So it's clockwise for the winter because heat rises and pushes down the hot air. Um, and then during the summer, cold air falls, so it pulls it up if you, you make it go counterclockwise. So that's a good way to um, utilize a fan. And then lastly, about to wrap up here, we have some utility energy efficiency programs that I want to talk about quickly. So if you do all this stuff in your own home and you're like, look, Matt, 
been there, done that. I'm pretty efficient. I don't know what else I can do. I would say that there are some cool programs that have been designed for folks to use less energy. The first one is something called hourly pricing. This is a program where you would pay the actual prices of electricity. So like I mentioned earlier, electricity changes two times a year, the price does. It's an average essentially of what the market's doing. So it changes once in summer, once in the fall. However, the real price of electricity changes every single hour based on what's happening. Is it a really warm day that we didn't expect? For example, sometime in April recently, where it was like 85 degrees and it's not usually 85 degrees in April. So we probably saw an increased amount of demand on the grid that could drive prices up. But maybe it's a much cooler day and people aren't running their air as much. We're not using as much energy as we expected and the prices fall down, right? It's kind of supply and demand thing. Makes sense to this grid. Um, and this is, I need to change this out too. Comment has recently moved to kind of a new way to look at this online, but I pulled this exact from the hourly pricing uh, portal online. And the, the blue dots are the day ahead prices. So this is what they predict the prices to be. And then the red dots are what the prices actually were. So this is from last summer, May of 2022. Um, and you can see that the price of electricity dropped into the negatives on this particular day. So if you were using electricity at uh, 7 a.m., 8 a.m., which most folks probably are, get ready for work and whatnot, you were essentially building a credit at this point in time. So if you were to do the dishes, charge your electric vehicle, uh, do some laundry, like big ticket items, you're saving a lot of money doing that, right? Um, but the reverse is also true, right? So if you have a day, which this was May 6th, so this day was May 8th, and this was just two days before it, the prices jumped up pretty significantly. So I think at this time, the prices were around like seven cents um, per kilowatt hour. And then they jumped up to about 11 and a half here. So if you were to, again, do the dishes, charge an electric vehicle, um, pretty expensive, right? You're gonna get knocked for that. But the idea of this program is that you would use outside of the peaks, try to use during the valleys, and you can save a, a decent amount of money. I think the average is anywhere from 10 to 15%, depending on the year. They report back on their findings on what folks are saving. It usually falls 10 to 15%. Um, so again, this is really good to save some extra money. It's good for the planet too, because whenever we see these spikes happen, in order to make sure that we have energy online at this time, we have to turn on these things called peaker plants, which are dirty fossil fuel um, generators that are we, we pay billions of dollars here in Northern Illinois to ensure that we have energy at that time. So instead of relying on those dirty generators, we would um, much rather have people just use outside of these, these peaks, right? Use during the valleys, and save some money. And then you can also, you know, benefit the planet while doing it too. So that's hourly pricing, really cool program. You can opt out. So you can opt in, try it out. They send you a report every, I think, yes, I've included a report. I used to be on the program. I'm not anymore because there is a caveat to it. If you use less than 400 kilowatt hours a month on average, capacity fee that's tied to it. And sometimes it can offset the actual savings. But if you use 400 or more, you can see some benefits. So right now I just live with my fiance. We don't use a lot of energy. Uh, but back during this particular time when I had it, which was around, I think, 2019, I was living with a couple of roommates. And we were using quite a bit of energy. And I was saving on average 28.9% uh, on average. And it shows you, it'll send you this every month. It'll show you what your uh, fixed price bill would have been and then what your hourly pricing bill was, and then what that breakdown was. This is a program through ComEd, again, and it's it's just to be, you know, encourage folks to be a little more energy efficient and use outside of those peak times. So it's a cool program to try out that makes sense for your home. It's especially good for high-end users. So people who might have electric heat, people who have electric vehicles, if you can shift your usage outside of those peaks, you can see some really cool savings. Next program is something called peak time savings. This is very similar to hourly pricing. This is our no-brainer program, right? This program is all carrot, no stick, as we like to say. This is tied to the concept of those peak times. We want people to use outside of those peak times. So hourly pricing is a really good way to do it. But if you're somebody like me who can't because I use, I don't use a ton and it doesn't make sense with the program, um, or it's just not something you think would make sense in your own home, you can sign up for peak time savings. And the way this works is they'll notify you on those days where we see those unexpected price spikes. They'll say, hey, Ms. Smith, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., use less than you typically would. If you do, you get about a dollar per kilowatt hour you save. If you don't, nothing happens, right? All carrot, no stick. It's just a way to incentivize folks to use outside of that. You can be on peak time savings and hourly pricing at the same time. 
So if folks aren't already signed up for this program, you definitely should be. It's, it's really good. Um, and again, I'll send out some info with like the website and stuff so folks can check that out, and get plugged in. The last program I want to mention is the um, direct install program of the home energy assessment. This is the joint program through People's Gas and ICORN and ComEd, where they'll send a representative out to do just a very facade level assessment of your home's energy efficiency. So they just kind of like poke around and say, oh, you're doing good here, you use some work here. But the most important piece of this is you get free stuff. You get a lot of free appliances, which is pretty neat. This is where the free LED light bulbs come into play. So they'll come out and they'll do um, LED light bulbs in every fixture. You don't already have an efficient bulb, programmable thermostat if you don't have one, low flow shower heads, faucet aerators, hot water pipe insulation, all for free. Again, taxes and fees. This is, this is yields from taxes and fees, right? This is direct results of that. So you're paying for it essentially. So if you haven't taken advantage of this, definitely should. It's a really good way to get LEDs and other free appliances. They'll also verbally ask you, you know, hey, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, we also have a um, smart thermostat and smart power strips. Do you make at or below this amount? I don't know if they do monthly or yearly, but if you do and you verbally agree that you make less than that, they can give you a free smart thermostat and smart power strip. So it's up to you to be honest, um, but that is also a part of the program. Really cool way to get plugged into some um, free programs. And again, this is the, the number you can call here to get signed up, this 1855 number, but I'll also send out some resources where you can go online and sign up. Um, you can just go online and set up time for an appointment. I think it generally takes like two hours, give or take. I think it's a little bit less than that. It depends on how big your home is and, and what they're doing. So not too bad. Um, lastly, we do have a petition for those rate hikes. Like Amelia was mentioning, um, I, I know folks online can see this link here. So you can go to our action center. Um, and this is really important stuff. So again, we do need the help. We're a very small organization. There's about 20 of us. We have two attorneys who are fighting all of the utilities. So we need people to help us out to file these public comments with our public utility commission here, the Illinois Commerce Commission, because that can help them when they're in these smoke-filled rooms trying to combat these rate hikes. Um, it, it's, it's helpful to have public input on this stuff. So definitely about these petitions. I know we were running low on time. I went over, this is my last slide, and this is just my email. Cubs hotline again. I'm always happy to chat um, after the fact. Um, and then Cubs hotline again is a really good resource for folks. If you have any future questions or complaints. So that, I'll open up to questions. I was hoping to have more time. I'm sorry I went so over, folks. Uh, but I don't know if we have any, any questions in the chat. I do, yeah. Um, one of our online people is asking, if I have solar panels, should I use hourly pricing with ComEd? Will it affect my sellback? That is a very good question. So I would need to get back with this person. There, It's complicated. I don't think it's as black and white with solar panels because it depends on when you're pulling and when those prices are. I think Again, I, I don't want to give out the wrong answer, but I think it might be beneficial to be on the program, but I think it it, it depends. So if that person wants to leave their email, I can get the info to them. I can talk to some of my colleagues, but there's been some rumblings about hourly pricing and how it works with, with solar panels. And I think just because of the nature of you're not using energy and you're pulling from your solar panels, but then at night you're actually pulling from the grid, it, it can make it a little complicated. So I'll get the, the info for whoever that is if they want it. Just leave your uh, email and I'll get it after the fact. All right. Well, if folks don't have any lingering questions, um, you, you have my email. So folks, if you want to uh, get plugged in or have some follow-up questions in the future, feel free to contact me. And then um, I'll send out all of the resources that I discussed today. I'll work with Megan and the library to, to get that to folks who, who join virtually. Thank you.